So hello and welcome to this webinar on Medra Coding Basics. I'm Caroline Wilson and work as a medical officer at the MSSO. I will be your instructor today and I'm supported by my colleague Leander Mold, who was speaking to you before. So together we will take you through this webinar, which will last for about two hours. We would like to make this webinar interactive, so please submit your questions or send us your comments through the question panel that you can find in the control panel on the right hand of your screen. Leander mentioned this already. And I will allow as much time as possible for questions both during the course and also at the end of the presentation. But please do not raise specific coding questions. Do not mention specific verbatims, as we can't help you with individual verbatim terms. But we can, of course, guide you in terms of coding principles. Just one additional remark before starting with the presentation. This is one of two webinars that the MSSO offers for new or less experienced MEDRA coders. The other webinar is called Advanced MEDRA Coding and nicely supplements today's topic. Many of you will already be familiar with the content of this slide. ICH adopted the development of MEDRA in the mid-90s and became the owner of the terminology as well. ICH then, on contract, appointed the MSSO to take care of the maintenance and further development of the terminology based on user feedback, also to provide and organize corresponding training like the one that we have today, and to administer the MEDRA licensees. And all these MSSO activities are overseen by the so-called ICH MEDRA Management Committee. ICH is not only the owner of MEDRA itself, but also owns this training material. It is protected worldwide. You may use the slides with the exception of the MEDRA and ICH logos, but will have to clearly indicate that ICH owns the copyright. Also, any adaptations of the slides of the content have to be clearly labeled. The second bullet point refers to warranty and liability issues you should be aware of. And the third bullet point is not relevant today because we will not be using any third party slides. Now let me provide you with an overview on what we will cover today. At first, we will shortly address the topic of MEDRA structure and characteristics. We will then discuss the need for coding conventions when using MEDRA and look um, into an important document you should make yourself familiar with, the so-called Points to Consider PTC document for MEDRA term selection that provides principal rules for MEDRA coding. We will then learn about the functionalities of the MEDRA browsers that are provided by the MSSO. You can use them for free in the framework of your MEDRA license, both in order to browse the terminology, but also to look for appropriate terms for coding purposes. And I will demonstrate how to use the browser to search the terminology and to look for um, appropriate terms. After that, I will go through some coding examples with you using the browser. And you will be able to try some coding with Medra yourself and provide your suggestions. And we will conclude with a question and answer session as mentioned at the beginning of the session. But we will address your questions throughout the session as well. The next two slides explain about the polling. Leander has mentioned already that we will be using quiz questions during the webinar. If you would like to join the quizzes and participate in the examples today, there are two ways to do so. The easiest way is to scan this QR code with your smartphone or tablet, and this will bring you directly to the poll. Or you may enter the indicated web address, pollf.com, into the URL bar at the top of your internet browser in your computer, tablet, or cell phone. It will then take you to a log-on screen, 
and you'll be asked for a username. The poll is completely anonymous, so you don't need to enter your name, but please enter my name as the username, that is Carol N. Wills 584 with no spaces. Nothing more needs to be entered. You can just skip this and click join. And Leander has put these credentials in the chat as well. You don't have to get under time pressure because you will be able to see these credentials on each slide that relates to the quizzes. Now, let's see if the technology works. Yes, it does, obviously. So where are you joining from today? So I'm sitting in Berlin in Germany. I see there's many people from, um, from Europe joining. Difficult to um, differentiate. I see Spain. I can see Spain. Buenos dias. I see many people in Turkey. So merhaba. I see people in um, Kenya, South Africa, also in, in Congo. In, so welcome. I see uh, somebody from Kazakhstan, India, China, Philippines, and uh, North America. So it's very early for you. Very good morning. <laughs> Australia is with us. So thank you for joining and happy to have you all with us. So let's start with our first topic. The basis for accurate MEDRA coding is a good knowledge about MEDRA scope, its structure, and its characteristics. So let us start with uh, one general question. What do you think are the benefits of using MEDRA? Why was MEDRA introduced at all? What is the benefit of its introduction? What do you think? In pharmacovigilance, yes, it was introduced in pharmacouniformity, yes. Common language, one front. Standardized coding across the industry, exactly. Uniformity, uniform, exactly. It's all about harmonization and standardization, not only in pharmacovigilance, but also in, in clinical studies, so in clinical development. Standardization is the key point here. Well done. So with the standardization achieved with MEDRA, we are now speaking the same language when talking about safety data from pre-marketing and clinical development to post-marketing and pharmacovigilance. MEDRA has replaced legacy terminologies like COSTART that was mainly used in clinical studies and HUART that was mainly used in post-marketing. It is not only used by the biopharmaceutical industry, but also by the regulatory authorities around the globe. Today, we will be focusing on the data entry aspect, the operational coding part. But MEDRA also has features that support data retrieval and analysis as well as the presentation of clinical safety data. So this whole topic is addressed in separate webinars. One is called Data Analysis and Query Building with MEDRA, and the other one introduces the so-called standardized MEDRA queries or SMQs. This is a key slide that shows what is in the scope of MEDRA or what type of medical terms um, is covered by MEDRA. In the blue circle here, you will find all medical terms and conditions that are within its scope. It incorporates terms for medical conditions like diagnosis and signs and symptoms, also pharmacogenetic terms, terms for indications for use, investigational tests and results, medical and surgical procedures, terms for medical, social, and family history of patients, toxicologic issues, as well as product quality um, issues and device-related issues. In addition, terms for medication errors and product use issues, 
were added in the last few years based on requests from regulators. And last but not least, the scope of MEDRA also includes the standardized MEDRA queries that I've mentioned before that are used for data retrieval purposes. On the other hand, MEDRA excludes terms that relate to frequencies unless such information is medically relevant, like frequent micturition, for instance, or frequent bowel movements. The same holds true for in indicators of severity. You will only find a few of them on PT level where clear medical definitions exist for the characterization of the condition, like in the case of uh, PT severe acute respiratory syndrome, for instance. You will not find numerical values for investigational results, but you will find qualifiers like normal, abnormal, increased or decreased, positive and negative. And patient demographic terms relating to race, gender, age, etc., are also excluded with the exception of terms where information regarding age or gender is relevant based on medical considerations, like, for instance, when it comes to male or female infertility, male or female breast cancer, senile dementia, infantile acne, or neonatal jaundice. So here you would find specific terms that include demographic information, but you won't find them for each and every medical condition. MEDRA is not a drug dictionary, nor is it a medical equipment device diagnostic product dictionary. So you will not find any brand names in the terminology, but there are several terms that include generic drug names, like for instance, the PT um, thalidomide, embryopathy. And you won't find brand names for, of devices, but terms for specific device types, like catheters, joint prosthesis, cardiac pacemakers, etc. And finally, the terminology does not contain any terms that refer to clinical trial study design, like double-blind, placebo-controlled, etc. Let us now shortly look at the structure of MEDRA and how MEDRA is organized. MEDRA has a systematic five-level hierarchical structure, starting with the system organ class, or SOC, on the top, and the high-level group terms underneath, the HLGTs, that then group the high-level terms, or HLTs. Under the HLTs, you will find the preferred terms, the PTs, representing the medical concept level. The PET level is used for data retrieval, presentation, and analysis. And the PTs then group the LLTs that are used for data entry and operational coding. You can see that starting from the top, MEDRA gets more and more granular and specific. That is from 27 SOCs, to more than 88,000 LLTs. So for coding purposes, you would browse MEDRA to find the most specific and accurate LLT for the reported medical condition of interest among these more than 88,000 LLTs. Please note that British English is used at the PT level and above, so British English. It is only on the LLT level where you find um, American English. So if you would look for a specific PT and use American English for your search in the browser, you will hardly get any results. Here are the 27 system organ classes. So some of these uh, SOCs group terms based on their manifestation site like the SOX blood and lymphatic system disorders, cardiac disorders, ear and labyrinth disorders, also musculoskeletal and connective tissue disorders, then renal and urinary disorders, vascular disorders. Other SOX group terms based on the etiology of the respective conditions, like for instance SOX 
congenital, immune system disorders, metabolism and nutrition disorders, neoplasms. Sox investigations and surgical and medical procedures group terms based on their purpose. In SOC, product issues groups terms that relate to product quality issues. And last but not least, SOC social circumstances contains terms that describe the social context of patients, like lifestyle issues, family issues, etc. So terms from this SOC should normally not be used for coding adverse events. In summary, you, would, you will need really good knowledge about the SOCs and their content in order to get a better feel on where to search in the Medra hierarchy to find a specific medical concept or term. Let's look at an example for the Medra hierarchy, in this instance in SOC cardiac disorders. Under this SOC, you'll find 10 HLGTs representing the main types of cardiac disorders. And here we have selected HLGT cardiac arrhythmias. Under this HLGT, there are several HLTs, grouping PTs for the different types of arrhythmias, like supraventricular arrhythmias, ventricular arrhythmias, etc. The HLT shown on this slide is the HLT rate and rhythm disorders, NEC. NEC standing for not elsewhere classified. NEC groupings are only found on HLGT or HLT level. They represent miscellaneous groupings of terms that do not fit into any other HLT or HLGT. So one PT under this HLT rate and rhythm disorders, NEC, is the PT arrhythmia, so a vague term. And this PT now groups a number of LLTs that are not all shown on the slide. Only a selection of those are, is shown on the slide. The LLTs now represent synonyms, quasi-synonyms, or lexical variants of the PT term, and um, also contain colloquial, patient-friendly terms. The LLT level is the data entry level, the operational coding level. And the granularity on the LLT level provides guidance to medical coders and thereby uh, facilitate accurate coding. Now let's look at the LLTs under PT arrhythmia that we see here. Arrhythmia NOS stands for arrhythmia not otherwise specified. Actually, it doesn't make a lot of difference whether you select arrhythmia NOS or arrhythmia for coding purposes. But it is really good practice only using the NOS terms when it is explicitly reported that a given condition could not be further specified. So if just arrhythmia is reported without any further information, it would be good practice to select LLT arrhythmia and not to assume that it is not otherwise specified. LLT dysrhythmias represents a synonym for arrhythmia. So what is important to remember and to, um, to recall is that each LLT is only linked to one PT. And some of the LLTs are labeled non-current, and you see one of them here, other specified cardiac dysrhythmias. So it's marked in red, and this is also how the non-current terms are highlighted in the Medra browser, in red. So what are non-current terms? They are only found on the LLT level, and LLTs are set non-current when identified as ambiguous, truncated, misspelled, or when not following Medra rules in the case for instance, of combination terms. They are flagged and should not be used for ongoing coding. They are not um, removed from the terminology in order to preserve the information from legacy cases 
So if you have locked the clinical database in the previous MEDRA version, you would still be able to find these terms, although they were made non-current, and could map them to a better term. An example for a non-current LRT is the co-star term nausea and vomiting, for instance, that was incorporated in MEDRA. It's a combination term, nausea and vomiting, that is represented by two separate MEDRA PTs. It has, of course, therefore, it has a non-current status and is grouped under PT vomiting. Another example would be the ambiguous term angina, a term that is most frequently used to describe angina pectoris, but that may also relate to angina ton tonsillaris. So these are the types of LLTs that are, have a non-current status. So here comes the next question for you. Which of these LLTs do you think are non-current in MEDRA? MI, insomnia with sleep apnea, bloody drainage, abdor, bloating. So here more than one answer may be correct. What do you think? Which of, the, which of those are non-current LLTs? I see you voting already, many of you. Yes, you are exactly right. All of them have the status non-current. Well done. Why? So MI is an ambiguous abbreviation and could stand for myocardial infarction, but it could also relate to mesenteric ischemia, mitral insufficiency or mental illness. Drainage could be a surgical procedural term um, referring to um, the systematic withdrawal of fluids or a non-surgical term referring to discharge and secretion used for the excretion of liquids from the body. Insomnia with sleep apnea is a combination term represented by two separate PTs in MEDRA. And abdor bloating is a truncated term and does not match the MEDRA naming conventions. So all of them are, have a non-current status. Perfect, well done. So we are now coming to another feature of MEDRA. And this is its multi-axiality. Multi-axiality allows for representation of PTs in multiple SOCs based on medical considerations. So what is meant by that? Let's take the example of dyspnea, shortness of breath. If I would ask you in what SOC you would expect this to be in, some of you may say in SOC respiratory based on manifestation side, but others may say in SOC cardiac disorders because Dyspnea is an important symptom of cardiac disease. Well, both of you are right, and you will find PT dyspnea under both system organ classes, one based on manifestation site, but also based on the etiology of the condition. This allows for data presentation and analysis based on different medical considerations, depending on your area of interest and also depending on product-specific considerations. In order to achieve standardization, again, standardization for cumulative data output of MEDRA-coded data, all PTs with multiple SOC linkages need to have a default or primary SOC assignment. So this primary SOC assignment will determine which SOC represents the multi-axial PT during cumulative data output and presentation for integrated safety summaries, periodic safety reporting, etc. The primary SOC is defined by MEDRA. This feature prevents double counting of events as a respiratory or cardiac condition in our example of PT dyspnea. And the standardization that is achieved by primary SOC presentation of data is required by regulators as well and has to be followed. 
So deliberate changes, even if your database allows for it, will not be accepted. Usually it is hard-coded in the coding systems, but if you have a system that allows you to choose, you must always select the primary system organ class. Let's first look at the rules for the primary SOC assignment within MEDRA. If the respective PT has only one SOC linkage, obviously this SOC is automatically its primary SOC. Easy. PTs for diseases and clinical signs and symptoms have their prime manifestation site as primary SOC. But there are three exceptions, and you see them here. Firstly, congenital and hereditary conditions always have the SOC congenital as primary SOC. Secondly, neoplasms or neoplasm terms always have SOC neoplasms as primary SOC, with the exception of cysts and polyps, which have their prime manifestation site as primary SOC. And thirdly, infection and infestation terms always have SOC infections as primary SOC. Again, most PTs are grouped based on their manifestation site, with the exception of these three system organ classes. Here an example using PT obesity, cardiomyopathy. It has the SOC, the primary SOC representing the site of manifestation, that is cardiac disorders, and a secondary linkage to SOC metabolism and nutrition disorders representing the etiology of the condition. Please note that um, a PT can have any number of secondary linkages, not just one or two. Especially in SOC congenital, there are PTs that represent very complex uh, congenital anomalies that affect multiple body sites. They may have up to seven secondary SOC linkages, like for instance the PT charge syndrome. All these additional linkages, linkages are called secondary. There are no tertiary or quaternary linkages. They are all equal. There is no ranking among them. Generally, the PTs are assigned a primary SOC based on the site of manifestation. But as mentioned already, there are three exceptions. SOC congenital, SOC neoplasms, and SOC infections. And here we see an example for one of the three exceptions. PT influenza has SOC infections and infestations as primary SOC and a secondary linkage to the site of manifestation that is SOC respiratory. Some PTs may contain information that relate to more than one of these exception SOCs. If so, the following prioritization applies for the primary SOC assignment. The congenital SOC has the first priority, neoplasms the second, and SOC infections and infestations has the third priority. As an example, PT congenital infection would have the primary SOC congenital based on this prioritization and a secondary linkage to SOC infections or PT infected neoplasm would have the primary SOC neoplasms and a secondary linkage to SOC infections. So this is how this prioritization works. In addition, there are three single axial system organ classes that you should be aware of. PTs in these three system organ classes only appear here and nowhere else. They are never multi-axial. They do not have secondary linkages. And these are the three system organ classes. Investigations, surgical and medical procedures, and social circumstances. You will not find any terms that relate to lab results of hepatic parameters in SOC hepatobiliary. You will only find them in SOC investigations. And you won't find terms for hepatic surgery, for instance, hepatic 
liver transplant in SOC hepatobiliary. Again, they are only represented in SOC surgical and medical procedures. And a term like hearing aid user, you'll only find in SOC social circumstances, not in SOC ear disorders. So this training will not be able to provide you with all details of MEDRA structure and related rules and definitions. To even better understand MEDRA, please refer to the MEDRA introductory guide that you can find under how to use and support documentation on the MEDRA website. And in this document, you will find specific MEDRA rules and conventions, as well as MEDRA naming conventions that are relevant to better understand MEDRA classifications. For example, per convention, the abdominal wall is considered a gastrointestinal structure, and the pharynx, a diaphragm, are considered respiratory structures. So I would highly recommend to study this document thoroughly so that your searches for suitable MEDRA codes, suitable MEDRA terms, are more focused and targeted. Especially for beginners or less experienced MEDRA users, it is really helpful and I'm sure that you will find this um, introductory guide useful. Are there any questions so far, Leander? Yes, we do have a question. Uh, thank you, Caroline. So we've had, how do you distinguish between renal mass, which goes to the SOC, renal and uterine disorders, and adrenal mass, which goes to the SOC endocrine disorders? Are they that different? Yes, there are. Renal, of course, uh, refers to the kidney. I come to this later on. And adrenal refers to a different, a different organ. And um, we will come to this uh, later on when, uh, when it comes to the examples. Thank you, Caroline. That's the only question. So uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. OK, so then uh, some more Paul's quiz questions for you. In which socks would you expect to find the PT ventricular arrhythmia? Exactly. Of course, the only information that we have in this term is ventricular arrhythmia. So it's a cardiac disorder. Cardiac disorder, it has no secondary linkage, linkages. It's a single axial PT, and it's linked to cardiac disorders. Well done. Next one. In which socks would you expect to find PT allergic eczema? Allergic eczema. I see most of you on the, are on the correct path here. You would expect them in skin skin disorders and SOC skin and immune system disorders. SOC skin would represent the manifestation side, the eczema, and um, the immune system disorders would represent the etiology of the condition, that it was an allergic eczema. Again, well done. Thank you. And this is the last one. In which SOCs would you expect to find PT colon cancer? Yes, most of you are got this right. So this would have the primary sock neoplasm because it's one of the exception, one of the three exception socks. Primary sock would be neoplasm, and then there would be a secondary linkage to gastrointestinal disorders in order to represent the manifestation site. So these two linkages. Well done, most of you got it right. So we will now talk about coding conventions. So what are coding conventions? Generally speaking, coding conventions are written guidelines for coding with MEDRA in your organization. It is crucial to have them, not only for your operational tasks, but also for inspection readiness. 
inspectors asked for them and you should have them available in writing to show that all medical coders in your organization are doing their job based on defined conventions. They may address topics like handling of misspellings, abbreviations or acronyms. Another area you may want to cover are combination terms or due to combinations of medical concepts. There may also be terms that you would always like to query, like for example, chest pain, to find out whether it is of cardiac origin or caused by other non-cardiac events, like for example, pulmonary embolism. But you may also want to query reports of an unspecified infarction or an unspecified necrosis, occlusion, etc., in order to find out the affected anatomical site. You may ask yourself why such documents are needed at all. Well, first of all, coders may have a very different background and they may need guidance how to handle very specific medical terms within MEDRA in order to achieve accurate coding output. Also, MEDRA is very large. You saw that, more than 88,000 LLTs. It nearly always provides a variety of coding options as compared to previous legacy terminologies. So coders need more guidance on how to prioritize and handle these options in order to achieve coding consistency, especially when they are working in different functions and geographical regions. And you may have the need for more specific coding rules for certain medical areas based on your own product portfolio, for instance. It is often assumed that autocoders that look for a match between a verbatim and an LLT would solve all these problems. But this is not the case, unfortunately. Even with very sophisticated autocoding algorithm and lots of testing, autocoders will not cover all verbatims. So manual coding will still be needed and autocoding results also will always have to be reviewed by qualified individuals with good medical background and sound MEDRA knowledge. Because not only human beings may assign wrong codes or code inconsistently, but also autocoders may run into problems when trying to interpret textual information that is relevant for coding. In the first example, it is reported that a patient had an allergy to a CAT scan and it was autocoded to LLT allergic to CATs. In the second example, a myocardial infarction in the fall of 2000 is reported. And this verbatim was split and autocoded to myocardial infarction and LLT fall. And these are real life examples that nicely demonstrate that a QC of autocoding output is definitely needed. We will now look into an ICH guidance document for our topic today that is called MEDRA Term Selection Points to Consider document. With this document, you do not have to start with your in-house coding conventions from scratch, but can take the guidance in this document as the basis for your own coding rules. Whatever you decide to do in your in-house coding convention, your rules should always be consistent with this document. Otherwise, you will run into problems during inspections or you may get feedback from regulatory authorities regarding your coding quality. If you have no need for in-house coding conventions, you may, of course, also use the PTC document as coding convention within your organization. Here is a snapshot of the front cover of the full PTC document. It is the latest version re released on March 1st this year and provides term selection advice for industry and regulatory purposes. It has, of course, the objective to promote accurate and consistent term selection in order to achieve a common language, to, to facilitate common understanding of shared data.
and it is recommended, I mentioned this already, as the basis for your individual organization's coding conventions. This document was developed and is further maintained by an international expert working group appointed by the ICH Management Committee with members from regulators and industry of the ICH regions, the MSSO, and the Japanese Maintenance Organization, or JMO, and the WHO as an observer. There is one original and comprehensive version that is available in English, Japanese, Chinese, Korean, Spanish, and Russian. It is updated with each major major version release that means beginning of March each year. In addition, there are condensed versions of this original document in other MEDRA languages, except those that I've just mentioned. And you see these languages listed on the slide here, Arabic, Brazilian, Portuguese, Czech, Dutch, French, German, Hungarian, Italian, and Portuguese. So these documents um, um, focus on, on, on the general coding principles without going into further details for selected topics. They are not updated with each MEDRA release, but on an as-needed basis, because the general coding principles, they do not change uh, too much over time. You'll find the document under the menu How to Use and submenu Support Documentation on the MEDRA website. So now let me show you how to find it, because it's really relevant. Here we are. Here is the MEDRA website. Here's the menu how to use, support documentation, submenu. Here we are. Here you have the points to consider document. Here's the Medra term selection document in PDF format, Word format, in HTML format. And you see that there is also a redlined version that is available. And this redlined version highlights the changes as compared to the previous version. So if you are already familiar with the document, you just, with a new version, you just have to refer to the redlined version in order to easily um, identify the changes that were made to the document. And um, here is the MEDRA best practices document I will mention later on. And if you, here is the latest MEDRA version, if you click on this little arrow here, then uh, arrow, then you see the introductory guide for MEDRA version 27.0 that I've mentioned earlier that is really useful to look into it in order to better understand MEDRA. And a summary is provided also with a what's new document for each MEDRA version. So summarizing the changes that were made in this, in this MEDRA version. Let me go back to my slides. Here we are. The PTC document provides comprehensive guidance and clear recommendations. But it is important to know that in some instances, it may provide more than one option to choose from. One of them will always be indicated as preferred one, but you are free to choose the alternative approach as well if it is more suitable for your organization. So whatever you choose, document your approach in your coding conventions, train your coders appropriately so that they are consistent in their choice of option. The information in section four of this document has been updated. So the versioning check section now refers the reader to the MEDRA best practices document that I've just shown you to find the latest recommendations on versioning. The final decision on versioning strategy is up to the respective MEDRA users, so there is no clear guidance. There's several options. But when you have taken your decision, document your version, versioning approach and the corresponding processes, that is, the timing of the implementation of new versions, what will be what kind of data will be updated in pharmacovigilance and in clinical trials, etc. 
Now let's look into some general coding principles that are addressed in the PTC document. Quality of source data, how to perform quality assurance, the rule to not alter MEDRA, or to always select the lo a lowest level term, to only select current lowest level terms, when to request a term, that one should use medical judgment in term selection, and also select terms for all reported information without adding information. And we will address them one by one in the next few slides. First topic is the relevance of good quality source data, the quality of data input. So the quality of your data input, of course, has a huge impact on the quality of your data output. So if you get poor data, unclear, ambiguous verbatims as a coder, always try to obtain clarification of the data. It is also advisable to have an eye on CRF standards, case report form standards, and design in clinical development. They must be carefully designed in order to provide clear data for coding purposes. As an example, if you have tick boxes on your CRF that are to be mapped to MEDRA, these should not be associated with multiple MEDRA terms because you wouldn't know how to code it, how to map this information to MEDRA. This means that MEDRA-related training is not only relevant for coders, but also for other fun functions in, in clinical development, uh, including investigators, to make sure that you get appropriate term specification for coding purposes. I've already stressed several times that your own organization's coding conventions should be consistent with a PTC document for MEDRA term selection. And please be aware that this is definitely expected by regulators. It is inspection relevant. The document then goes on with the topic quality assurance. Code assignments should be QC'd with an appropriate and systematic approach by experienced coders or physicians that are MEDRA experts. That is also true for autocoder output, as I've men mentioned earlier. And by the way, the also regulators perform coding QC of data submitted by different companies and provide feedback in case of relevant inconsistencies or coding issues. So thinking about data quality, you've got a reported term or verbatim of compression T4, T5. Would you code it or would you seek clarification? What would you do? Compression T4, T5. I see you voting. Let's see. Some of you would code, others would seek clarification. So let me close this. So that's interesting. So I would see clarification in this instance and would query this term. So why wouldn't we code this? Why wouldn't we code this? What's, what's the problem with this term? Compression T4, T5. It's too vague. Yes. It's ambiguous. Correct. Too vague. It should be more specific, exactly. This is why this term should be queried. The affected site is specified. It is the thoracic spine, but we don't know what exactly is compressed, whether it is the vertebra due to a compression fracture, for instance, the intervertebral disc, the spinal cord, or a nerve root. This needs to be clarified, and that is why I wouldn't accept this term I was if I was a coder. So thank you for joining. This would need to be queried for further clarification. What is compressed here? Now let's have another short exercise before addressing the next journal term selection principle. Once you have selected an LRT that re represents the verbatim, you choose the SOC that makes medical sense, or you follow the predetermined MEDRA hierarchy. What would be your choice?
Once you have selected an LRT that represents the verbatim, would you follow the predetermined medra hierarchy or would you choose the SOC that makes medical sense for coding purposes? Let me close it. Well, most of you got it right here. You would, of course, follow the predetermined medra hierarchy. So this is what I've mentioned. It's uh, the primary SOC assignment. It's hardwired in MEDRA. So you should not make your own choice, but you should really... The, the strength of MEDRA is it's, it's the standardization. And if you start making changes in the hierarchy, you would put at risk the strength of MEDRA, the standardization. So you should always um, uh, follow the predetermined MEDRA hierarchy. Very important to remember. Even if your database allows for making a choice, you should follow the predetermined MEDRA hierarchy. We already talked about this principle to not alter MEDRA when addressing the primary SOC assignment that is hardwired in MEDRA. If you find that a term is inappropriately placed in the terminology, you should not change the MEDRA hierarchy, but instead submit a change request to the MSSO through the established change request process so that it can be reviewed and considered. That's the option that you have. You should not make ad hoc structural changes. If you find that something is incorrectly placed, that a primary SOC assignment is not following the MEDRA rules, then please submit a change request, but do not make any ad hoc changes. Coding is done on LLT level, the data entry level. We also discussed this before, and only current LLTs must be used in ongoing coding. The LLT selected should capture as much information provided by the original verbatim. As can be seen in this example, reported is an abscess on face. So this verbatim should not be coded to just abscess because it is medically relevant to also capture the manifestation side because an abscess could manifest in the, in the brain, in the lungs. And in this instance, it was uh, the manifestation side is on the face. So here we would select face LLT facial abscess in order to capture as much information from the report as we can and LLT facial abscess is linked to PT subcutaneous abscess, whereas a, a, an abscess in the brain would be linked to PT cerebral abscess. Here we see a pulmonary abscess, all separate PTs, because they are representing different medical concepts. And always remember to select current LLTs only. The non-current LLTs are still in the terminology, for historical purposes to support interpretation of legacy data and legacy data conversion. But they should, should not be used for ongoing coding. Really important to remember. Beside the previous example with a reported abscess on face, here another example where you may struggle with MEDRA specificity. How would you code red skin on soles of feet? you see that there are plenty of somehow suitable LLTs to choose from. Skin red, erythema of extremities, plantar erythema, redness of legs, localized erythema, because only the feet are affected. What, what would you do with this one? Red skin on soles of feet. Skin red would be very close to the verbatim. Erythema of extremities would capture manifestation site. Legs would be even more specific. What would you do with this one? We have split of opinions, but the majority is uh, voting for plantar erythema. And um, this is the right approach here. Let me close it. Plantar erythema is a separate PT. All other LLTs are grouped under PT erythema. So in this instance, the code assignment makes a difference on PT level. 
and plantar is just the medical term for the soles of feet. So sometimes you really have, if you don't find a suitable um, LLT, it's useful to replace colloquial terms, common language with medical terms to see whether you find a suitable LLT in the terminology. If you can't find a suitable MEDRA term that adequately represents the medical condition to be coded, don't solve it with workarounds, but use medical judgment. As an example, at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, when receiving a report of an event related to COVID-19 infection, one wouldn't have found an exact term for it in MEDRA. But when using medical judgment, you would have found terms like coronavirus infection, not as specific, but capturing the medical concept on a more general level. So this term was to be selected as a placeholder before COVID-19 terms were added to MEDRA. So avoid workarounds, look for a more general term, look for terms with a slightly different wording that represent the concept, use online references and medical textbooks like the Dorlins, the professional version of the MSD manual in the net, access medicine, websites of well-known university, hospitals, etc., to check for synonyms in medical terminology because these may already be represented in MEDRA, as we saw with our, with our plantar erythema example. But if, despite all these efforts, you finally cannot find a suitable term, then submit a change request to the MSO for a new term to be added to MEDRA. Medical knowledge is more relevant for coding than in previous times when coding was in the hands of data managers. MEDRA requires sound medical knowledge and quite frequently also the input of physicians to achieve medically accurate coding output. Other questions so far, Leander? No questions at this moment, Caroline. I think you're coming to uh, some of the points. So if there's still questions, uh, and they're not answered at that point in relation to off-label use, then um, okay. uh, I'll ask or the person will come back in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Remember, we are still with the basic principles for MEDRA term selection. So when coding, do not omit medically relevant information. In other words, make sure to capture and appropriately classify all reported events. We are not interested in causality because it is captured elsewhere in the database but we should capture all reports of device-related events, product quality issues, medication errors, medical and social history data, investigations, and indications as appropriate. As mentioned in the previous slide, we should cover as much of the medically relevant information of the reported verbatim as possible. And we saw that in the previous example describing a facial abscess, um, we had to do so. So it was important to really capture the manifestation side. But on the other hand, we should not add any information. In this example, no diagnosis pancreatitis should be made out of the signs and symptoms shown on this slide. Abdominal pain, increased serum amylase, and increased serum lipase. So do not make a diagnosis out of it, but code each of these uh, terms separately because they are represented by separate LLTs and PTs, abdominal pain, serum amylase increased, and lipase increased. So do not interpret and make a diagnosis out of this information. This is not our job as coders, but should take place when it comes to data retrieval and analysis, where one would look for clusters of findings indicating specific diagnosis. As coders, we would split such a report and code all these findings separately. After these more general coding principles discussed in the first part of the PTC document, the second part then addresses some specific coding topics, individual types of data, and how to handle them in operational coding. And here they are diagnosis and provisional diagnosis with or without signs and symptoms, 
death and other patient outcomes, combination terms, congenital terms, investigation terms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, the list even continues on the next slide. So we will not be able to cover all of them today due to time constraints, but quite a number of these are addressed in the webinar Advanced Medra Coding. So here you see the next ones, medication errors, accidental exposures, occupational exposures, overdose, drug interactions, off-label use is addressed there, there modification of effect, etc. So in order to efficiently and also effectively search for suitable MEDRA terms for a given verbatim, it is not only relevant to understand MEDRA structure and rules and the details of the PTC document for MEDRA term selection and your own in-house coding conventions, but it is also crucial to make yourself familiar with the MSSO MEDRA browsing tools or your own in-house MEDRA browser. They the MSSO browsers are free to use by all MEDRA license holders, and I will introduce some of the functionalities that are relevant for operational coding in the next two slides. The MEDRA browsers are used not only to browse the terminology to, in order to find suitable terms for coding, but also to find suitable standardized MEDRA queries for data retrieval purposes. And out of the three browsers that the MSSO offers, one is intended to be installed on local computers, it's the Medra desktop, desktop browser, and two are accessible via the internet, a mobile version for smartphones and tablet computers, and a version for use with a laptop or desktop browser, the web-based browser and the mobile Medra browser. The desktop browser can be downloaded from the MEDRA website together with the release files of MEDRA and makes you independent from internet access, which is sometimes really useful. All three browsers require MEDRA ID and password. To, they allow to view and search MEDRA in the SMQs. They support all MEDRA languages that are available. They also have a language-specific inter user interface, and this is not relevant for coding purposes here. But there are some features of the browsers that mainly relate um, to, to coding, and I've highlighted those here in red lettering. If you are considering to the submission of a change request, for instance, to the MSSO, and would like to see whether one another MEDRA user has already submitted such a request and it was accepted, then the supplemental view of the browser is really useful, and I will show this later on. And for coding purposes, the view of the primary and secondary link information and the advanced search options are very helpful to make your searches more focused and efficient. So now let me switch screens in order to give you a short introduction into the basic functionalities um, of the MEDRA web-based browser. So here we are. Here is the MEDRA website again, and on the top you find a shortcut to the web-based browser. So if you click on it, here it is. I select the preferred long language English. Here is my MEDRA ID and my password, and then I can log in. Here we are. This is how this browser looks like. On the top, you have configuration options. You can select your preferred language again. And um, important, it is important to, to um, know the legends. So if a PT has a blue square around it, it is a, you are looking at a multi-axial term, and you are looking at it in its primary SOC. If it has a green square, it's again a multi-axial SOC you're looking at in its secondary SOC. Red square means it's a single axial, uni-axial primary term. Blue square means primary SOC term. And here you have the non-current LLTs in red lettering with a red square around it. Important to remember that. And then you have you can open a new browser window. 
um, you have a shortcut to the MEDRA documentation, to the points to consider documents, and also to the MEDRA introductory guide to the website. Here is a user guide for the tool, very informative. So if you are not familiar with it, uh, how to search, additional search features, other features that you can um, use. So if you are not familiar with that, read the user guide because um, the tool really has a lot of useful functionalities. You can select three languages. Um, so here we have the so-called explore window where you see all the system organ classes in alphabetical order. I could now say I do not only want to see English, but I would also want to see the, the Dutch and um, the Spanish language version. And you will see um, the SOC names and all the terms underneath in these three languages. This may be useful for you as well. So, but now let me switch back to, to English. You can also select a, ver a Medra version back to the first version that was released, uh, that is version 2.0. So let us keep it with the latest version 27.0. You, as I mentioned before, you can search MEDRA itself, the terminology, but also the standardized MEDRA query. So we will focus on operational coding in the SOC view um, today. And um, you can show the codes if you like. Then to the term names, you always have the code. You can copy the code. And you could also show the non-current terms. So let me switch off the show codes feature. And let us look into the explore window here. So in this explore window, you can do top what we call top-down searches. Let's assume that we have a verbatim um, and uh, what is reported is an insufficient cardiac function. Insufficient cardiac function. So I could do a top-down search based on the manifestation side. I would look into SOC cardiac disorders. Here are the 10 HLGTs, amongst those also cardiac arrhythmias we saw before. And here are the heart failures. So, and you see the HLTs, right ventricular, left ventricular, heart failures, NEC, not elsewhere classified, heart failure signs and symptoms. So our insufficient, insufficient cardiac function is not specified, so we would look into heart failures, NEC. And we have the color coding now here. The cardiac failure is single axial, as you can see. Can see. And if I look into this cardiac acute chronic, it's not specified what kind of cardiac failure it is. So we would look into this more vague PT and look for an LRT that best captures the verbatim. And this would be cardiac insufficiency, because we had an insufficient cardiac function, cardiac insufficiency. You see here are two non-current terms, because I have still clicked show non-current LLTs. Here we have a typo in the LLT name, and hydropic decompensation is an ambiguous term, because in hydropic decompensation could not only result from cardiac failure, but also from renal failure, for instance. So cardiac insufficiency would be the correct code here. If I click on the term on this LLT, you see the hierarchy here. It's a, it's a single axial term. Here's the hierarchy. And you also see in which SMQs this, um, this PT or the corresponding PT is included. So this was the top-down search. You also have the option to search, uh, to use the search window in the center of the user interface. So let's assume that we have a kidney insufficiency. Here we are. And let me search for it. Here we have an acute cortex, adrenal cortex. Here is the adrenal versus the renal. 
and um, insufficiency renal. So the tool does not only provide me with the word in kidney, but replaces kidney by renal as well. And this is due to the synonym list. And the synonym list should be ticked because the synonym list, the use of the synonym list, replaces some terms like heart with cardiac, kidney with renal, um, etc. So this is always useful. It's a useful feature of this tool. So always keep it activated. And we had the question before with adrenal and renal. Of course, the adrenal insufficiency, um, it, it's an insufficiency of the adrenal gland. It's not an insufficiency of the, of the kidney. And um, so it's a completely different medical concept. And of, of course, I would only like to see uh, the renal insufficiency terms that may be relevant for my search. So here, the advanced search comes into play. And I can now say I would like to see the kidney insufficiency, but I would not like to see adrenal terms. And then search again. And you see that all the adrenal terms are not, not shown anymore. I, I'm just having the renal terms. And here is the ins renal insufficiency. This would be the best approximation to my verbatim, renal insufficiency. Again, a single axial um, LLT and PT only grouped under renal and urinary disorders. So let me go back to the basic search. And um, you may now want to, to look for, for um, renal parameters, abnormalities of renal parameters. So um, you could then um, restrict your search to SOC investigations and say that you would like to see renal terms in SOC investigations helps you um, to arteriogram. Here we have some renal um, lab values. If I click on this term and say, go to browser, right mouse click, go to browser. Here's the, you see it's an uniaxial. It's the uniaxial SOC investigation. So you won't find any terms um, they do not have any secondary linkages. And this now brings you to um, the tissue enzyme analysis. And, um, and let me see creatinine, renal clearance. Again, go to browser. Here we are, renal function analysis. Here we are under the HLGT renal and urinary tract investigations and urine analysis. So this is a good way to restrict your search if you, if you know that you are only looking for surgical interventions or investigational terms. You can restrict your search to the specific SOC you would like to look into. And um, what you could also do if you just click on one LLT, you can copy the code, you can copy the term in order to paste it in an, into another document. You can open the history of the term. It will show you when it was added to Medra, what changes occurred over time, over the versions. And I've already shown you um, the go to browser feature. Now, um, what about the supplemental view? We are looking into the released version of Medra. If I click on this little arrow here, I can select the supplemental view. And here we have the supplemental view. The um, screen changes in color. You see that in order to make you aware that you are not looking into the, into the released version of Medra, but the next forthcoming um, Medra version, so the current status of version 27.1. And let's assume that you have um, um, a lab test result, adrenal antibody positive.
So let me again switch back to the released version and look for adrenal antibody and search liver kidney. No, there is no adrenal antibody. So let me, we would now look into the supplemental view and check whether this may have been added to Medra already before submitting a change request for this term and search. And here they are, adrenal antibody test, adrenal antibody test negative and adrenal antibody test positive. So these LLTs and PTs are have a um, green dotted line around them. So this identifies the so-called supplemental terms. So these are accepted for addition to the terminology, but will only be released with the next Medra version, Medra version 27.1. So a nice feature, saves you time if you want to submit a change request to look for these terms because they may have already been added to the terminology. Now let me switch back to my slides and continue. Are there questions, um, Leander? No questions at this time. Thank you, Caroline. Okay. So then let's continue and uh, continue with some of the, our exercises. So first of all, some tips and hints that you should be aware of. <clears throat> In a first step, when trying to code a verbatim, you should not directly access the Medra browser, but first have a look at your reported term, the verbatim. You should check if it is a clinical condition, a diagnosis, sign or symptoms, if it is an indication for use, a test result, if it relates to an injury, a procedure, whether it represents a medication error or a product use issue, whether it represents a quality issue of the product or a social circumstance of the patient, and um, or procedural complication or even a combination of these. Because the type of report will then influence your search for suitable Medra terms. If reported by healthcare professionals and in medical language, your search can be much more focused and finding a suitable Medra term will be straightforward. If it is a consumer report, the verbatim may be vague and not as easy to classify. So if something is reported vaguely, don't try to make more sense out of it, but remember the fundamental Medra coding rule, code as reported, and do not add or subtract information when coding. So break down the information to find what has actually been reported, and this will help you to find the best way to find it in the browser. When browsing Medra for a suitable term, first use the word, from the reporter. When doing so, it is best to use word stems like intestine to cover both the wording intestine and intestinal. If your wording is too specific and too narrow, you will miss suitable terms otherwise. And also consider synonyms when searching for a condition affecting the leg, like lower limb or lower extremity. And tick Use, synony uh, use the synonym list feature in the browser to further support your search. I've shown you this. And if you have found a somewhat suitable term, look at the neighbors. There may be better, even more specific terms for your verbatim. If not successful, browse the Medra hierarchy with top-down and bottom-up searches. So here again, the details about the polling, just in case you've lost the connection and the QR code in order to access the tool again. And let's start with our first example. So here it is reported that the patient suffered an allergic reaction to an antibiotic. So let me switch to the browser in order to show you how to approach such a term. Let me switch back to the released version. And if I enter allergic, reaction and search, I will find an allergic reaction term. Here we are. If I go to the browser, I see 
Here it is, allergic reaction. And it's grouped under, oh, many, many, allergic conditions, NEC. So all the allergic conditions are grouped in this HLGT. Now let me check whether they are at the others. Allergies to foods, food additives, drugs, and other chemicals. So this looks more promising because what we have here is a drug allergy, an allergic reaction to an antibiotic. So let's check this one, top-down search again, and see what we find here. Drug hypersensitivity, here we are. Much more specific than just, drug, uh, than just allergic reaction. And the second one here is allergic reaction to antibiotics. So this would be um, the correct term to choose from. And this would be the approach um, combining um, looking at the neighbors also on HLT level in order to find the most accurate, more specific term for the reported condition. Let me switch back. So next one. In the second example, the patient states that she is experiencing cold sweats. So here I have prepared a quiz, quiz question for you. And what would you search for? So what would you type into the browser in order to find a suitable term? What would you type into the browser when looking at this verbatim? Cold sweat. Any further ideas? Cold sweat. Everybody is voting for cold, cold sweats. Cold sweats, yeah, you would enter the verbatim as it was reported, sweat, sweat and cold. So some of you would enter the actual wording, others would uh, just use a singular term. And um, so let's go to the browser again and see what we can find. If I enter cold sweats, And search, I won't find anything. If I make it a singular term called sweat and search, I immediately find uh, a direct hit. Same PT. So, Medra is a singular dictionary dealing with individual events, so always look for the singular. The closest match here is called sweat, and this is what. I would have to select. So well done, most of you got it right. So sometimes you cannot take the actual wording of the verbatim, but you have to follow the Medra rules. So it's a singular terminology. So if you have cold sweats, for instance, you would make it of fevers, then you would make it a singular term. In the next example, two abnormal lab results are reported, an increased troponin and an increased CPK-MB. So this information, again, should not be combined by selecting, for instance, LLT cardiac enzymes increased. Remember, always code as specifically as possible. So this verbatim needs to be split, and each finding has to be coded individually. So let me again look into the browser. Here we are. And look for troponin and increase. Oops, I still have the cold sweat in there. Of course, then I will not find anything. Here we are. So we have specific terms for troponin T and I and C, but ours is not specified. So cardiac troponin uh, increased would be the correct code assignment for the first part of our verbatim. Cardiac troponin increased, under PT troponin increased. Now let's look for the next one. CPK MB. And here we are. 
CPK MB increased. Here it is. And here you see the PT, blood creatinine, creatine phosphokinase MB increased. So um, this is obviously an unambiguous abbreviation, so that's why it's included in MEDRA. And we have a perfect match to what has been reported in our verbatim. So let me look for the The cardiac enzymes increased. This is a summary term. So, of course, if card the increase of cardiac enzymes is reported, you would use it. But always remember, code as specifically as possible. So, in this instance, we have very specific information. So, our verbatim needs to be split and coded specifically to troponin increased and to CPKMB increased should not be summarized under cardiac enzymes increased. Next one. Here we have a reported medication error. The patient took the wrong drug by mistake and experienced shortness of breath after intake. So again, we have two separate events, a medication error and a complication after this medication error. So let's again search. If I enter incorrect drug, get no suitable hit, incorrect drug administration duration, storage, no. So let's use a synonym here. Instead of incorrect, I will say wrong drug and search. And here we have a direct hit, but it's uh, very vague, just wrong drug. We know that um, the patient took a wrong drug. So we are looking for an administration term, wrong drug strength administered, one wrong drug administered. Here it is. So here we can capture the fact that the wrong drug was actually administered, that it was taken by the patient. And here it is grouped under wrong product administered. And the complication, the sequela after it, it's easy to capture because shortness of breath is a direct hit in MEDRA. Here we are, short, shortness of breath, here it is under PT dyspnea. So this is just to show you how to handle, how to search for terms in the browser. Next one, a two day old baby was noted to have a mild fever and you hear that it doesn't like it at all. And here it's your turn again. What would you look for? What you, would you type into the browser in order to search for a suitable term? A two-day-old baby was noted to have a mild fever. Fever, yes. Baby fever. Fever. Neonate. Mild fever, neonatal fever. Yeah, here somebody is, several of you are suggesting to, to include the demographic information, but most of you are going for fever. So let me again switch to the browser here. If I enter fever and search, I get 191, uh, all the different fevers, so lots of. So let us try to, to find a more specific term to capture the demographic information. Baby was one of the proposals. No, nothing. Child and search, nothing. No, let's enter, uh, 
newborn because it's just two days old. And I get the LRT fever neonatal. So again, the synonym list has replaced newborn by neonatal. And it's a separate PT, fever neonatal. If I go to the browser, right mouse click, click on it. And if I, if I look at, into it in its primary sock, here it is, fever neonatal. It's in the general sock. Here we have the, in the term details window, we see primary sock is general disorders, but it has a secondary linkage, this PT, to pregnancy sock. So um, here we could really capture the demographic information. So it's always worthwhile to try to find a term that captures as much information as possible of your verbatim. And several of you have suggested to do so. So well done. The next example does not describe an adverse event. Uh, what is it that was reported here? A 35-year-old 30, woman was taking drug X to prevent relapses of multiple sclerosis. Well, it is, of course, an indication for use of a drug that is the prevention of relapses of multiple sclerosis. So again, let me search in the browser for a suitable term. And if I just enter prevent and multiple sclerosis, always using word stems, I don't find anything. So multiple sclerosis terms are in there, that's uh, for, for sure. But uh, let us replace prevention with a synonym like prophylaxis and search again. And here we are, multiple sclerosis relapse prophylaxis. Really a very specific term for this indication for use. If I click on this PT, I see the hierarchy. It's a, a term, of course, in surgical and medical procedures. It's a medical treatment. And uh, therefore, it's, it's grouped under surgical and medical procedures. And remember, this SOC is never uh, multi-axial. So all terms in this SOCs are always single axial. They do not have secondary linkages. Really important to remember. Any questions so far? Leander? Yes, Caroline, we have a couple of questions. So we have, if a particular LLT belongs to two systematic SOCs and the predetermined primary SOC does not suit the verbatim, can I choose the alternate SOC? I wouldn't do so. Uh, so if you, um, this is something that is, these decisions are not taken during the coding process. In the coding process, you try to, to select the most accurate and specific term that you can find in the terminology. And um, if um, the secondary linkage would be more appropriate, this is something that you can consider when presenting the data for data analysis uh, purposes. Then you can uh, try to, to present your data not only with the primary SOC assignment, but also with the secondary linkages in order to, uh, to support your data analysis, the, the medical assessment of the findings that you have for, for the product. But for, um, for coding purposes, just rely on uh, the metro hierarchy. Unless, as mentioned before, you really find that something is completely out of order, that it doesn't make any sense, that does even contradict the metro rules, then you can submit a change request. But you should not change make any ad hoc changes, never, during coding. Thank you, Caroline. And uh, another one is, there are two LLTs, both current, for example, upset stomach and stomach upset. If they mean the same and belong to the same hierarchy, why are there two terms and which one should I choose? 
Well, this is um, just, these are the lexical, what we call lexical variants. So it's a word order variant. It's just um, supporting autocoding purposes. That's why we have those in the terminology. Uh, it doesn't make any difference. Usually we would say, well, try to keep as close to the verbatim as possible. So try to, to match the word order that you see in the verbatim. That's best practice. But content-wise, it doesn't make any difference. I fully agree. It's just to support autocoding purposes. Thank you, Caroline. And then just one more. I'm not sure if this is in scope, but uh, I'll read it anyway. Um, and then you can advise. If the reported event is appendic appendixonomy for appendicitis, would you code appendixonomy? Sorry about my pronunciation. We have an example of liver transplantation for liver injury, where we are coding both. Yeah. Uh, this really depends on your in-house coding conventions. Yeah, how do you handle such data? So usually um, you would code to the condition and not to to the surgery. But in pharmacovigilance, of um, for instance, you would code both based on the uh, structure of your database. And um, if you have very yeah very important surgeries, so very invasive surgery, like for instance, a liver transplant, then um, depending on your coding conventions, you could really request to split these terms and code both because of course a, a liver transplant somehow conveys the severity of a, li a liver damage or a liver disorder that the patient suffers. But it, uh, this is really, there is no clear guidance in this regard. Um, other than the, the in pharmacovigilance, the, the data fields that you have in the E2B um, format. And that's it for questions at the moment. Thank you, Caroline. Okay, thank you. So let's continue then. So here we have an example for medrow specificity. What is reported is that a patient had a pathologic fracture of the neck of the left femur. So remember the basic MEDRA rule again, code as reported and capture all relevant information. So here a specific etiology of the fracture is reported because it is not a traumatic but a pathological fracture. And we have the affected site that is reported. Here it is the neck of the left femur. So in the browser, I would then look for the relevant information, femur, and just enter fem for femoral and femur, and search. And here I have the pathologic fracture of the neck of femur. So perfect match, <coughs> excuse me, an APT pathologic fracture. And um, you will see that this is completely different from uh, the usually traumatic fracture would be grouped under the SOC injury and poisoning. Pathologic fracture is also grouped under <clears throat> injury poisoning procedure complications. SOC, primary SOC is musculoskeletal and connective tissue disorders based on the manifestation side, etiology, injury poisoning procedural complications, but because of the fact that it is a pathologic fracture and these pathologic fractures often occurs in patients suffering neoplasms, it also has uh, a secondary linkage to SOC neoplasm. And you would see that uh, just a traumatic fracture So close fracture of femur, here you see it. It's, it's grouped under injury poisoning and procedural complications because it's clearly indicated uh, or assumed that it is a traumatic fracture. It's not a pathologic fracture. <clears throat> Next, it is reported that after a procedure, a patient experienced constipation. So what would you do with this one? 
Following the procedure, the patient experienced several days of constipation. What would you search for? What would you type into the browser? Procedure and constipation. Constipation only. Constipation. Yes, word stems. Procedure in order to capture procedural and procedure. Very, very good. So most of you would try to use both parts of the of the wording in the verbatim constipation, but also the fact that it's a post-procedural event. So let me switch back again and look for constipation only because there's not too many terms in Medra, so we can directly find for enter constipation, we see again neonatal, chronic, aggravated, and here is the post procedural, also post operative constipation is available. So here we are post procedural constipation. If you would have a longer list of, uh, of, of potential hits, you would of course use a word stem here and then you would have the post-procedural constipation directly. So that would be more efficient, um, the search. So this would be the correct code assignment. Well done. Next one, we look at a report on a fatal case where a 66-year-old man suffered a ruptured aortic aneurysm. So what is important to know is that based on PTC guidance, death is considered an outcome and should not be coded when a reason for the death of the patient is reported. So we sh would have to look for the ruptured aortic aneurysm. And this is really straightforward. And we do not have to look for it in the browser because you would enter the strings rupture, not ruptured, aort, to capture both aorta and aortic and aneurysm. And you would find the LLT aortic aneurysm rupture under the same PT in SOC vascular. So this is an easy one. What is important to remember is that if a reason for the death of a patient is reported, then just code the reason for the death. Uh, death itself does not need to be coded in these instances. Quite frequently, product quality issues are reported with or without sequela. Here it is reported that the product was a counterfeit. So when entering counterfeit in the browser, here we are. Then we see that there is a suspected counterfeit product term or um, a, pr a product counterfeit as well. Here we are, have two, but we have really reported that it was determined that the product was a counterfeit. So the product counterfeit would be the best choose choice here, the best term selection that we can provide. And if you click on it, you will see, of course, it's grouped in SOC product issues because it's, uh, of course, connected to product quality issues. The next example provides us with the information that the patient is confined to a wheelchair. So this is, again, your turn. What would you search for? Patient was confined to a wheelchair. What would you do with this one? You would search for wheelchair. Yeah, this is the only thing that we what we have and see paraplegic. Well, it could just be weakness, severe weakness of the patient. Don't make a diagnosis of always code as reported. And again, in the interest of time, let me check. And I would, as you have suggested, I would look for wheelchair. And here it is, wheelchair users. It's the same PT. If I click on it, 
you will see it's under HLT disability issues, under HLGT lifestyle issues, in SOC social circumstances. The other SOC that is single axial. So um, if such an event would be reported as, as an adverse event and not in medical history, one would ask for more information why this patient was confined to a wheelchair. But if no further information can be obtained, then LLT wheelchair user would adequately capture what has been reported. And example number 12 again relates to a medication error, not an administration error as seen before, but a medication error at the stage of compounding during preparation of a medication in a pharmacy. So, and again, if I just enter compounding here, without a typo, because otherwise you won't find anything, and click search. So we, we know that uh, it was made in error. It was made, a mistake was made when compounding the medication. So it was a product compounding error, not a quality issue of the product itself. And here we are, product preparation errors and issues, in stock injury, um, product compounding error, and at the PT, product preparation error. And here's the last one. Um, here, a narrative is shown. Um, so previously, we had individual verbatims. And here, we have to perform term extraction and then code the highlighted medical information one by one. So what do we have here? First, we have the indication for use of the drug, rheumatoid arthritis. We have the medical history of the patient. The patient suffered colon cancer and cigarettes smoke and also have, was a, a smoker. So um, three code assignments so far. He developed an aortic valve stenosis, fourth one. And because of that, that's the adverse event. Because of that, he underwent an aortic valve replacement and after that developed a sternal wound infection after the surgery. So another two terms that need to be extracted and coded. And all these different types of information can be coded with MEDRA, the indication for use, the medical history data, the adverse event, and the subsequent surgical procedure followed by a post-operative complication. Any questions? Further questions, Leander? No further questions at this time. Thank you, Caroline. OK. So then let's try to code some verbatims. So now it's your turn, really, to code. And here you have the username and password for the web-based browser of the MSSO that you can find with this shortcut on the web, Medra website. Or you may also use your own Medra browser or your own credentials in order to access it. And uh, Leander has also put it in the in the chat for you so that you can see it and enter it. And here's again the QR code just in case you lost connection to our polls. And here's the first verbatim. She was diagnosed with pneumonia caused by COVID-19 infection. So what would you do with this one? Different medical information. So it's a COVID-19 infection causing a pneumonia. Do we need to split here? Do you find a combination term that would cover what has been reported? Yes, COVID-19 pneumonia. Exactly. So we have a combination term in MEDRA. And exactly, well done. Let me show you in the browser. So if I would enter just pneumonia, again, this would be something where you would get many, many, many hits, because so many here, 266 hits. So here we would have to narrow down our search 
and just enter COVID and then search. And here we have the COVID-19 pneumonia. Here it is, same PT name. So well done. Oops, kicked me out. Let me go back. Here we are. COVID-19 pneumonia is the correct code assignment. Next one. Woman ingested her husband's blood pressure drug by mistake. So woman ingested her husband's blood pressure drug by mistakes. So it was not her drug that she was supposed to take. She took the drug of her husband by mistake. What would you do with this one? What would be the appropriate code assignment? Woman ingested her husband's blood. Accidental ingestion of drug. Any further proposal? Drug by mistake. Wrong drug. Wrong person administered drug. Drug ingestion. Yeah, very different proposals here. It's it's a tricky example as well, I have to admit. So what do we have? Wrong drug, yes, wrong drug would be one option. But this would really represent a medication error. Is this a medication error? Medication errors refer to the drugs that a patient is supposed to take or something that is done by healthcare professions that they are um, at, uh, providing the wrong drug or something like that. These are medication errors. What we are looking at here is not a medication error per se. So let me do a top-down search here under HLGT, medication errors and other product use errors and issues in SOC injury. And you see that in this HLGT, we have accidental exposures to product. So all the other HLTs uh, represent medication errors or product use errors, either done by patients, family members, or healthcare professionals. Um, but here we have something different because it was an accidental exposure of the, of, um, of the wife. She took the drug of her husband by mistake. So accidental device ingestion, device ingestion by child, accidental exposure to product, elderly pe person, we don't know. So let's look into P PT accidental exposure to product. Not with the eye, it was an ingestion. Accidental ingestion of drug. Here, this would have been the correct assignment and some of you have suggested to, uh, to do this. So here, um, what you have suggested to look for here, it would really be best to do a top-down search in SOC injury in order to find the best term. But remember that if somebody is taking a drug, uh, a child is taking the drug of the grandmother, for instance, or here the wife is taking the drug of, of uh, her husband, these represent accidental exposures. This does not represent a medication error. Here we are. Next one. The patient developed hyponatremia while hospitalized. Can you capture this information? Hyponatremia is clear. Can you capture all information of this verbatim? What would you do with this one? Hospital acquired hyponatremia. Perfect. Yeah. So um, you have found a perfect term. So um, we have some of these um, terms in Medra. Let me show you in the browser again and look for hospital and hypo natremia. Oops, again, a typo. 
hospital acquired hyponatremia, both in British English and in uh, American English. We have that. This is how you can find it. Here we are. And this is the correct assignment. So in British English, because this is how it was reported, we have some of these hospital acquired or nosocomial terms, especially for infections in, in, in Madras. So it's always worthwhile to look for them. So there are two more exercises left. Next, it is reported that a nurse noticed that the injection solution had an unusual odor. The injection solution had an unusual odor noticed by the nurse. So what would be the correct LLT for this one when looking into the browser? If you would look for injection solution, you would product, it's, it's a product quality issue, yes. So you could do a top-down search, abnormal order. This could also refer to a patient, that the patient has, uh, has an abnormal sense of order. But difficult product quality issue. Yeah, you could really look into um, this sock and do a top-down search. But let's check the, the browser here and see what we what we have. So we have um, order. And let's try to keep it more general, not to have injection solutions on it, but just use product and search. And here we have product order abnormal. So sometimes it's better to, to, um, to enter a more general term because you won't find um, the specific wording in Medra that the injection solution had an unusual order. So here product order abnormal would be the correct code assignment. If I do a right mouse click and say go to browser, you will see that there's a product order abnormal product smell abnormal. So there is nothing that would represent the drug. So here it is sometimes really helpful to just look for a product, an LRT that contains product and the specific abnormality, in this case, the abnormal order. So what I would like to tell you is that you should not confuse these terms that really represent product quality issues with some terms that you can find in the injury poisoning and procedural complication sections under medication errors and other product use errors. Because there you find some, some terms that relate to product use complaints. And if you look for product complaint and search, product use complaint, here it is, go to browser, and you see it's grouped under this HLG, HLGT that refers to medication errors and other product use errors and issues, and product use complaint PT contains um, terms like dislike of product taste, medication too hard to choose, product difficult to administer, to swallow, um, so this represents um, preference of the users of the medicinal product, like patients or consumers, and do not represent objective product quality issues that may be introduced during manufacturing, labeling, packaging, shipping, whatsoever. So always clearly distinguish between these two concepts, just to make you aware. Here's the correct code assignment. And again, Lex, the next and last one, elderly woman complained her arm was tender where she had received her seasonal flu vaccine. What would you do with this one? She received her seasonal flu vaccine and where she had received it, her arm was tender. 
tenderness flu vaccine. Again, you would need vaccination site tenderness. Perfect, yes. Again, you have to be more vague. You would not find uh, specific terms for flu vaccines, but you would find just reactions to vaccines at the respective site. It's the administration site, yes. Arm tenderness would be too, too vague. Let me show you. So what we have here is a side reaction. It's tender. And it's because of the vaccine. And if I search for such a term, you find immediately vaccination site tenderness. And if I do a right mouse click, go to browser, primary SOC is general disorder SOC. And if, I, if I look into it, you see that the administration site reactions, um, HLGT contains application site reactions. So application site reactions um, terms are used when you have um, topical medications, creams um, or, or patches, drug patches. Implant catheter site reactions, infusion site reactions, injection site reactions, installation site reactions, and vaccination site reactions. So injections, it's an injection, yes, but it's an injection of a vaccine, and they are represented in a separate HLT. And you see that there are many, many terms that are available, available here. And vaccination site tenderness is grouped under vaccination site pain. So entering information like flu vaccine or arm would not um, give you any, any um, helpful hits in MEDRA. You have to keep it more general in this instance, your search. And with this, here is the correct assignment, vaccination site tenderness. This is a summary of what we have discussed today. Sorry for being a bit late. And this is your last chance for questions. Do we have questions, Leander? We have one uh, that just came in in relation to uh, the short verbatim exercise number two, where the woman ingested her husband's blood pressure yes. drug. Um, we had, does that distinguish between an accidental ingestion of a study drug versus an ingestion of a prescribed drug? No, no. It's just an accidental exposure. So also if a drug, um, an investigational drug is taken by a child, for instance, you would choose um, the respective um, LLT and PT under the HLT accidental exposures. So this would be an accidental ingestion of drug by child. No differentiation there. Any further? There's no other, no other questions at this time. Thank you, Caroline. Okay, so these are some um, helpful links to additional information, also to the Medra browsers, to the change request submission tool, to the training schedule where you find information about the next scheduled webinars, and to the again to the Medra support documentation. And this is what you can find in the schedule part of our website. Here's our webinar today. You see that it's also offered in French on 21st of May. And here's the advanced Medra coding webinar that I've um, addressed uh, at the beginning of our webinar. So next week, Thursday next week, I will provide the advanced Medra coding webinar. And you see that it will also be provided by uh, colleagues in Korean, in French again, in Chinese in May. And we also have additional uh, offers for medical coders that are a, little, a bit more advanced. These are the Let's Code Together webinars. The next one is scheduled for the 21st of May and will be provided by my colleague Jane and myself. So we are two of us are presenting and it's a workshop format and where the registrants get the verbatim information that will be discussed 
at this webinar uh, beforehand, one week or so beforehand, so that they can prepare for the discussions. And we have different examples for each of these sessions. And in addition, we also offer a separate webinar for medwar coding of medication errors, the general principles, how to classify the use errors. And there also, because we had this question before regarding off-label use, um, we also explain how to classify the different differences, um, how to differentiate medication error from a use issue, from misuse, drug misuse, and off-label use. So, and uh, you cannot only contact us uh, via our help desk, but also via different social media, as you can see here. What I would like to show you is our YouTube channel, because this may be relevant for you. Uh, bop, 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 bop. Wrong. Wrong choice. Here we are. And here we have our website. And here, if you click on contact, this page will open. And if I click on this icon, YouTube channel, it will be you will be brought to our Medra YouTube channel. And here you will find recorded sessions of our webinars in different languages, in uh, Portuguese, in Spanish, Korean, Chinese, French, Russian. Um, so you see the different colleagues here. And if you, um, if you would like to see, for instance, um, some webinars in Spanish, then here you see coding best basics presented in Spanish, advanced medra coding, data analysis and query building uh, presented in Spanish by our colleague Tomas. So uh, this may be helpful for you to, and also our Let's Code Together webinars are available here. So this may be helpful for you if you cannot attend um, a webinar due to time constraints. Um, here you find all this information, and this is also where you find the recorded session of today's webinar in, in a few days from now. Just to let you know, this, let me go back to my slides. And with this, uh, sorry for being late, um, nine minutes late. Nevertheless, I hope you found this webinar useful and hope to meet you again in one of the trainings that we offer on a regular basis. As I've shown you, it's always difficult to, to find the correct um, balance between uh, explanations and time constraints. So sorry for, for overrunning a bit, but um, I would like to, 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 to uh, thank you for, for joining, for your interest to, in today's topic and also for your active participation. And thank you, Leander, for your support today. So enjoy the rest of your day, wherever you are, many, many locations, as we saw. And goodbye for now. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.